Welcome back. So I have about uh, 20 minutes. And in the 20 minutes, what I want to show you is um, um, show you is uh, how, so if we were to take upper division circuit class, so what we are talking about now is something called the linear circuit element. It's something that's uh, supposed to be very simple, something that doesn't require a lot of uh, advanced mathematical techniques to work out. But what you have seen so far doesn't look that way because what you have seen is that once we introduce the capacitors and inductors, then we have to start using tools of calculus, right? And so what I want to show you is um, how we are going to turn the clock back so that when you have circuits that deal with the inductors and capacitors, we are going to be answer, we are going to be able to answer some important questions about these circuits using nothing but algebra. No calculus, just with algebra. So I will work this out using calculus, and then you will see that with a, part, a certain identification of a particular concept that we would have called complex impedance, that what used to be calculus problem turns back into an algebra problem. So uh, let me do uh, this RR circuit, which is not a real thing, <laughs> um, as the, the register register circuit, um, so that you see the method that we are going to apply throughout all these three problems. And then um, uh, I'm getting, oops, this should be an R2. I'm getting at a particular result that I can point to and say, um, using that result, we are going to uh, come up with an idea that will allow us to solve these portions of questions using nothing but algebra. Well, complex number algebra. Okay. So um, these are all voltage divider circuits. Do you recognize this as the voltage divider circuit? Yes? You've seen voltage divider several times now. <laughs> you saw it um, in the DC circuits lab. And if you've been working through homework, you've seen a voltage divider. It was on your exam too. One of your exam to multiple choice question was a voltage divider circuit. So um, <laughs> if you haven't seen voltage divider, that's because you haven't been studying. It's not because you didn't have a chance to see it. So um, we call this a voltage divider because when you work through this uh, circuit, this so call this voltage in, call this voltage out, and the formula for voltage out is actually um, ends up being this uh, pretty simple formula, um, R2 over so the voltage, the resistance here, divided by the total resistance, R1 plus R2, um, times the input voltage. Like this is the formula that you have seen, you have derived. Um, and I guess um, in the interest time, I'll leave this here. You guys know how to get at this formula using at least a couple different methods. You could uh, get at this formula by first uh, figuring out the current, that the current going through here is the applied voltage divided by the equivalent resistance, and then multiply that with this, that would get you that. Or you can use the entire you know, Kirchhoff's rule uh, uh, arsenal here. So, but um, what's important here is that this is the formula you end up with. And what I want to do in the remaining time is I want to go through this LR circuit and the RC circuit properly so that I'm not using any shortcut. And we are going to look at the result and um, see that the result reminds me also of something so that where if we introduce this particular concept, then it's a shortcut that you can take when you're analyzing circuits of this kind. So, for all of these circuits, they have to have one same characteristic. It has, it's that they have to be a driven circuit. So really what I should have said it is this is a driven uh, R, R, LR circuit. This is also driven RC circuit. And this is what it means by being driven. This voltage source, it's an oscillating voltage source. Um, so this uh, voltage input is going to be in the form of some oscillation amplitude times cosine of omega t or sine of omega t. But because I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to use e to the i omega t to represent the oscillating portion of that voltage source. Okay? So some amplitude times e to the i omega t is the input voltage. 
And you know, if you really, if you are uncomfortable with these complex functions, what you can always do is imagine taking the real part of this, and you say, well, that's what I really mean. So you know, if I want something that's oscillating like sine 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 of omega t, I have to make my v not imaginary, so that the whole thing will come out. So, so uh, for the rest of the calculation, I'll just keep these complex uh, functions as it is with the implicit understanding that if you ever want to get back to what you do literally measure on your oscilloscope, you just take the real part. Good. Okay, so I want to find the voltage output here. So I'm going to go through the motion of uh, uh, Kirchhoff's rule, uh, the law application um, to um, find the voltage here. So. To find the voltage there, um, I can say the voltage out, wait, oh, it's a voltage across the inductor. So I should be able to say this. The voltage across the inductor it, as a function of time is equal to the inductance times di dt, still a function of time, right? So what I should do is I should, Try to get on. Um, I should try to get an expression for current I, and then I can take the derivative and figure out this voltage across the inductor. So, so you know, it, it does come down to the same thing, same old thing that we do every single time. We uh, consider this loop. Um, say there's a current flowing around this way. Apply Kirchhoff's rule to find the value of the current, and then once I have that, then this is a single step. So let me write down Kirchhoff's loop rule. The loop rule says that when you add up all the voltage changes, as you go around the loop, it should add up to zero. And this time you have a time-dependent voltage applied, but that doesn't change Kirchhoff's rule. This is a general circuit-solving method. It's uh, equally applicable when everything is time-dependent, as it was when it was just a DC. So let me write it down. Uh, as I go across the voltage um, source, so I gain this much voltage. So plus V naught e to the i omega t. As I go across the register, I lose some amount of voltage, call it minus um, current i as a function of time, times r, right? As I go across inductor, this time um, I, well, I guess this time and every single time, I lose some amount of uh, uh, voltage as I go across the inductor. So as I go across the inductor, I have um, minus um, um, L times di dt, and all of this should add up to zero. Everything good? Yes. All right, so, um, well, um, this is an inductor circuit, so it's actually pretty simple. There's no capacitor there, so no Q to worry about. All I have is current I. So um, that's the only unknown. Um, so I'm going to have, so I don't need any other equations. This is my one equation that I need. So to solve for current, I guess um, what I'll do is the same thing that we did for last couple times. We are going to guess what uh, current I is. Um, I guess to justify why we are not using separation of variables, like we did last time when I was dealing with the uh, first order differential equation, is that this time I have this term here. I have something that now explicitly depends on time. So you will find that if I try to do separation of variables here, it doesn't work because of this term here. I think it's called the inhomogeneous term, whatever. Um, so separation of variable doesn't work. You can try it on your own time, it doesn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna give a guess. And as I have been intimating a few times now, um, the convenient to guess as physicists have every single time is an exponential. So I'm going to guess that, in fact, I'm going to be a little bit more specific. I'm going to guess that my current will look like this. It'll be some I naught, some magnitude of current. It'll be constant, but it may be complex. Times um, e to the I omega t. 
So I think because my voltage source is oscillating at a particular frequency omega, that the current is also going to oscillate at the same frequency. And you know, if it doesn't turn out to be this omega is a constant, we'll figure out what it is. But I'm going to put it in this format because I think that's what it's going to end up being. Yeah? Or I guess if I want to be sure, I can call it omega prime oh, and do it later. But you know, I'm pretty sure, so I'll just leave it as omega. Um, let me rewrite this one more way. In fact, I can uh, rewrite this uh, constant complex coefficient in a way that it separates our two aspects well. I can re rewrite this as the real value i naught times a phase vector times e to the i phi. So that um, it's, this is a you know, two parameter complex number but each of them, the parameters have a very clear meaning. This is the maximum value of current. This is the, you know, on which cycle are you starting? Is the current bearing as cosine or sine? Okay. So let me use this as my guess. So I'm going to plug this in here, see what I get. So let me do that. Plug it in here, so the first term doesn't have any i in it, so it'll be v naught e to the i omega t minus um, I times R minus I naught e to the I phi times e to the I omega t times R minus L times the first time derivative. Uh, well, it's a um, it's an exponential, so the derivative is simple. When I take the derivative, a factor of i omega comes down. So it's uh, minus L times i omega times i naught e to the i phi e to the i omega t is equal to zero. Good? Yes? Okay, let me cancel out a few things that cancel out right from the get-go e to the i omega t cancels out. It's in every single term. In fact, if you are making mathematical argument, that's what you do. do. You do start out with omega prime, and then you do say, well, the only way that to add up to zero for every value of t, omega prime has to be equal to omega. Uh, all right. And uh, I guess that's all that cancels out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for, wait, what am I trying to solve for? I'm trying to solve it for um, current i. Oh, so I guess um, this is really the main unknown that I'm trying to figure out here. I'm really trying to figure out this i naught. Yes? So, in, yeah, yeah. So um, let me do that. Uh, in fact, I'm going to solve for this i naught times e to the i phi. So I see that term here and this term here. So let me factor it out. When I factor it out, this is what I end up with. Uh, v naught minus, uh, this factored out, i naught e to the i phi times r plus this here i omega l, all of that is equal to zero. And when I solve for the current, this is what I end up with. The, um, solving for this, i naught e to the i phi is equal to, so you know, move this over and divide it through by this. So it'll be v naught over r plus i omega l. In fact, um, let me change up the plan of what I was gonna do. I see that I only have five minutes left. <laughs> and um, let me give you an equivalent problem that I can do more quickly. This is really how I should have done. So here, what I've done is I have essentially solved for the current here, right? I have this uh, coefficient. I multiply by e to the i omega t. That's my current as a function of time. So I'm going to compare this to the expression for the current here. So the expression for the current that's going through this circuit will be, um, will be the V in as a function of time, d 
divided by um, uh, R1 plus R2. So it will be uh, V0 e to the i omega t over R1 plus R2. Or, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is the current with, with this uh, time dependency here. Or if uh, we write it the same way we did it there, it would be I0 times e to the i v is equal to, and this got canceled out in the, um, in the derivation process. So you have this V0 over R1 plus R2 as the maximum amount of current that flows through here. So this is what I want you to see, that this expression looks, uh, bears some resemblance to this expression here. Let me do this for one more circuit, the RC circuit, to see, um, to see that this resemblance it doesn't stop here. So l let me do one more. So with the three, it will be easier to uh, spot the pattern. So let me do this for the RC circuit. So for the RC circuit, this is what it looks like. So I'm going through the Kirchhoff's rule all over again. So say sum of all the voltage changes uh, through the loop, um, say that's equal to zero. So this is the loop I'm thinking of. So the sum of all the voltage changes is my applied voltage, V0 e to the i omega t. As I go across the register, I lose some amount of voltage, minus i times r. As I go across capacitor, does the voltage drop or rise? So here, as you are charging, uh, the voltage will drop. Because if it's a, uh, imagine positive current flowing, this will play will be positively charged, this will be negatively charged. So as you go around, it's going to be a voltage drop. So you are going to have uh, minus uh, Q of T over C. Um, so all of that is equal to zero. Um, so we do the same thing that we did the last time. Um, so here, I, I will just have to give you the answer. The current I of t is going to be um, just the dq dt, no minus sign in front. Or you could say it's plus dq dt that gives you the correct sign. Um, so with this, this uh, uh, the loop rule equation ends up being v naught e to the i omega t minus r dq dt uh, minus q over c is equal to 0. So here, we do the exact same thing that we have done so far. We guess an exponential as an answer for this q. We say q as a function of time. q as a function of time, we guess it's going to be some maximum amount of charge um, and times uh, e to the i phi, the phase factor, to account for the fact that this constant is going to be a complex number, times e to the i omega t, oscillating at the same frequency as my applied voltage. So when you plug this into this uh, differential equation, this is what you end up with. You have um, v naught e to the i omega t minus r times uh, this omega t, or i omega comes down, so minus i omega r, I guess that's it, um, times um, q naught e to the i phi e to the i omega t. That's the second term. And the last term, minus q over c. So uh, q naught over c e to the i phi e to the i omega t is equal to 0. So um, I can solve this for Q of t. So solving it for Q of t, this is what you end up with. Q of t, so you know, this is Q of t, and um, so is this is Q of t. Solving for Q of t, I get, um, just algebraically, I get um, 
this is equal to, so, well, uh, let me not skip too many steps. I've already skipped it many steps. Um, so let me uh, uh, combine these two terms and factor out Q. Then I end up with V naught e to the i omega t minus factor out Q of t, Q of t times this term here, i omega r plus this uh, 1 over c. 1 over c is equal to 0. Let me solve for Q of t. Q of t is equal to V naught e to the i omega t divided by uh, i omega r plus 1 over c. Okay. To compare the result here, I need to take one more step because I'm trying to compare to the current. So I need to use this expression here to take one more derivative. Take this, take the derivative with respect to time, then what you see here is that all this, this is all constant. V naught is constant, I omega r is constant, 1 over c is constant. So here the time derivative will simply bring down a factor of I omega. So that you end up with this. All of this is, um, so, so that you end up with current or dq dt is equal to this times i omega. So i omega times v naught over i omega r plus 1 over c times e to the i omega t. Let me uh, uh, do one simplification. I'm going to multiply top, divide top and bottom by i omega. So that this is equal to V naught over I omega cancels, R plus 1 over I omega C times E to the I omega T. So this is, for this RC circuit, this is the current through the circuit as a function of time. And when you look at here, I really should have done the same thing across. Sorry, uh, I'm switching back and forth. My, my apologies for this. Confusion. Um, so, if I want to describe here, if I want to describe current as a full function of time, then I should take this uh, and multiply back this e to the i omega t. So let me write that down so that I can compare the same expression throughout. Current as a full function of time is v naught over r plus i omega l times e to the i omega t. And here, the current as a full function of time is equal to uh, V naught over R1 plus R2 times E to the I omega T. This is for the two register voltage divider circuit. And with these three expressions, this is what I want you to look at. When you look at these three expressions, you will see they share some common features. They all have the same voltage V naught. In fact, they all have the same V naught e to the i omega t. That's my applied voltage as a function of time. So I can go one more step to try to make this look simple. Let's say combine this to say this is the applied voltage as a function of time. Here I say this is the applied voltage as a function of time. And this is applied voltage as a function of time. Then this is what I'm hoping you are noticing. That so the for all three expressions, the numerator looks identical. The only differences are in the denominator. But even when you look at the denominator, some parts of the denominator are still the same. Which part is the same? The R1, right? It's the same R1 register that's uh, in all three circuits. So this part is the same for all three of them. So this is the identification that I want you to start making. So in this class, we don't have enough time. To, so this is the 
if I had a, you know, 20 minutes to more, this would have been the beginning of the discussion of complex impedance. But to bring this particular thread to conclusion, let me just point this out. This is the quantity that we are going to identify with a kind of resistance. That's easy for R2, that is resistance. <laughs> I'm not doing anything new here. Uh, whether voltage is a function of time or not, nothing funny happens here. The, something interesting happens with inductor and capacitor. We are going to associate this with a kind of resistance that we can associate with um, inductor. So this is what we call impedance. So if you want to look up the word for it, so this is what's called the impedance of an uh, uh, inductor. It has uh, two features in it that I want you to notice. It depends on omega. It, it depends on the frequency of the signal that you are applying. So that's why I had to assume that my voltage is being applied at some particular frequency. And the second thing is um, it has a, a I in there, imaginary number in there. Um, so this is what we call complex impedance. In your textbook, they will try to cover this in terms of phasor. So the phasor for the impedance of an inductor, it's going along the y-axis or something. Um, for me, you know, when I saw that, when I saw, uh, you know, studying lower division physics, none of that made any sense. When, it did, when this actually did make sense was when I was teaching upper, div or when I was taking upper division uh, uh, circuit class where all of this is described in terms of the complex impedance. That's where the math is simpler and it's easier to make the connections. So this, this uh, omega L, I omega L is kind of a resistance we associate with inductor. And it sort of makes sense. The higher the frequency, the inductor resists current more because you know, the, the change of current has to have faster, so the voltage needed across inductors are larger. And uh, uh, this one is maybe a little bit harder, that's why I'm doing it the last. This, one over I omega C, is the kind of impedance for a, um, so this would be the capacitor impedance. So that's uh, what we associate with. So um, I don't know, this one is a little bit harder to give an easy meaning to. <laughs> so with the capacitor, I guess one thing you can say is that if omega is very large, if the voltage is uh, switching back and forth quickly, then the amount of voltage drop across the capacitor is very small. You could understand it as maybe the amount of charge building on the capacitor being very small. Before any amount of charge can build up, the voltage flips and it drains again. But so, um, so once again, if we had 20, 30 more minutes, we would talk about impedance. Uh, more, but um, I'll just leave that there. Um, and this is sort of the reason why I introduced the complex numbers, um, complex numbers on Monday. To, in order to get this far at least, um, we have to have the complex number uh, description.